You know, one of my favorite lines in scripture, it's when the, the wise men from the east, they're, they're pursuing Jesus, looking for this savior who was to be born. And uh, it says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And uh, we have a lot to rejoice about. We know Jesus, the risen Savior. Let's stand up to our feet, open with prayer. Lord God, I thank you for, Lord, your goodness, Lord Jesus. And we, we just celebrate you today. We honor you. We bless you. Lord, I thank you that you have made a way for us to come into your presence, for us to, to walk in the fullness of what you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would be, Lord, just all of our lives, we are yours. Lord, I pray, would you come and inhabit our praises this morning? We love you. We serve you. Jesus, be blessed. Amen. Let's sing to Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, the way I'm wired, I, I tend to like to rush through things. <laughs> but I've learned over the years, it's important sometimes just to, to chill and to pause and to, to listen, <laughs> to worship. I just want to pause together this morning as a congregation as we still ourselves before the Lord, say, God, not our will, but yours. Lord, we are your servants. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening, waiting here for you. God, we don't want to do today without you. Thank you, Jesus. Spirit speaking to anybody this morning. I just want to make space. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hmm. You know, there's just been a, a theme on my heart the past couple of days just the reality that God is calling his people out, calling his people out of darkness into light, calling his people to be holy as he is holy. And, and that certainly it's, that's always, a, that's always true. It's in scripture, you can read about that in 1 Peter 1, 2, 3, and many other places. Uh, but I just feel like there, there's, the Holy Spirit is doing something in us right now in this season, calling us uh, away from compromise, calling us away from the things that can, can trap us in which we can be ensnared, and calling us into freedom, calling us into his righteousness that he has for us. Lord, you call us to be holy as you are holy, and it's not something we accomplish in our own strength, Lord. It's your Holy Spirit at work in us. So Lord, the, how do we walk in this holiness? Lord, we repent and we humble ourselves before you. We embrace your lordship. We yield to the work, to the faithful and good and effective work of your Holy Spirit. Come and work in us, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Um. <laughs> kind of piggybacking off piggybacking off of that um while we were singing this chorus um psalm 139 just kind of came to mind and it says search me god and know my heart test me and know my anxious thoughts see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting and i was just struck again that it, this walk with the lord it is personal and it is supposed to be a relationship and it is a constant it should be a constant relationship and at the same time he is God and we are not and there's the element of sometimes I'm blind to what he, what's even going on in my own heart I, I, I have idols that I don't even know are there I have fears that I don't realize exist and there's that prayer of come and search me and then tell me if there are offensive things in my heart, that I could then surrender those things to you and walk in everlasting life. So I just want to encourage you, remind you that this is a personal relationship 
This is not just something you do on Sunday morning and check it off the list. He is God. He is friend. He is shepherd. He is Lord. He's redeemer. All those things. Amen. Amen. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah, Lord. We need you. Come and have your way in us, I pray. Thank you, Lord. You are everything. You are everything you've promised. Your faithfulness is true. And we're desperate for your presence.
Amen. Lord, you are good. Lord, I thank you that you are the God who saves. You've come for us, your people. And Lord Jesus, you are coming again. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, welcome. Worship team, thank you for leading. You may have a seat. Hallelujah. God is good. Come on. And all the time. Amen. Amen. My two favorite Christmas carols in one worship set. Hark the Herald Angels Sing has like always been my favorite, and then O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's, it's, a, it's a close second. Boom. I love it. You know, there are several verses we don't typically sing because it gets wicked long, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's amazing just the, the, the biblical allusions and the, the richness. If you ever have the chance... Pull up all the verses sometime and just enjoy O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I think actually a couple years ago I preached through that text. Well, I preached the biblical text that that hymn references. Uh, just so much, so rich. Amen. Well, hey, it is great to be together. I want to welcome all of you, but I want to give a special welcome to anyone who's with us for the very first time. If it's your first time here at Christian Fellowship Center, we have a packet with a little bit of info about the church and also a book we'd love to give to you, just a gift from us to you. So other than this, we won't put you on the spot, but if it's your first time, could you just raise your hand up nice and high? Greg, awesome. Welcome. Keep your hands up. Greg will get you those packets. Amen. And uh, I'm going to put you super on the spot, Tucker, because you're not familiar with this. But you are here with a new visitor for the first time. Uh, could you, you just uh, shout out to the church? What's the name of your baby? Congratulations. Great to see you guys. Yeah. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Excellent. Uh, two more notes before we take a break. The first note is this. Uh, Christine Thrasher has arranged, I think maybe with, with Lauren's assistance, to do some gift giving around the holiday season here to bless some of those who might not have uh, stable connections, people in, involved in, in and out of the foster system, things like that. Uh, Lauren works with YAP, Youth Advocate program, something like that, and uh, has some connections. And so Christine has laid out on one of the tables in the bar a bunch of envelopes with a tag inside. It has some information about a potential gift that you could grab. And so if you're interested in helping, getting a gift for someone who might not feel tons of support and... and uh, it's an opportunity to support them, love them, pray for them. So the envelopes are on the table. You can take the tag out, and Christine asks that you would write your name on the envelope and leave it so that she kind of knows who to be expecting to get gifts back from. And then if you could bring the gift back next week or connect with Christine some other way, uh, get the gifts back. And Christine, where is Christine? Sweets. You said gift bags, not like normal wrapping paper, because people might check the gifts first. Okay, awesome. And uh, any other instructions, Christine? Perfect. It's uh, something that we've done for a couple of years. It's really, it's, it's a simple but special opportunity to show some support to people in the community. Um, also, in two Sundays, we will have a, uh, a, a little sharing here down as part of our main worship gathering from the children. They've been working on some music and a little presentation. And uh, for that, we have opened up the children's program to children 12 and under. And so what we're going to do is take a break now. And parents, you can bring your children towards the front of the building if you're interested. Everybody else, grab a drink at the bar. Bless somebody. We'll resume in a few.
If I could ask you to, f oh. If I could ask you to find your way back to your seats, we'll continue in just a moment. Okay, if I could ask you to find your way back to your seats, we'll resume in just a moment. Headset's not loud enough. <laughs> Good, good, good. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's going to be 2022 soon. You know what? I had decided I was going to call this present year just 21. And like half the time, I still said 2021. Did, did most of y'all say 2021 or 21? Like, I, I'm going to try... It's going to be, it's 21 and 22. Like, at some point, anybody, like, in the 80s and 90s, you never said, like, 1999. You're like, 99. Well, this, this is year. It's a good year, 21. It's a decent year. <laughs> um, anywho, I'm just tired of saying the 20, but then I do it. Uh, Hey, before we continue on, Cheryl mentioned that she felt the Lord is stirring something in her heart. So, Cheryl, why don't you come on up and share that with the body? When we were worshiping, I, I felt the Lord stirring in my heart as we sang with our hands lifted high in praise. We're coming up on a new year. So many people sit down, write um, resolutions for the new year. I believe God is stirring in us, calling us to turn to him. Ask him what his plan is for us for the new year. Um, I believe he's calling us to step higher, to go higher, to step out of our mediocrity, our everyday, same old, same old. He's calling us higher. He's doing incredible things in our midst, and he's calling all of us to seek his plan for our lives. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. You know, like the best day to make a uh, a change is always today, but probably one of the easiest days is the beginning of a new season. And so it's, it's, it's a blessing from the Lord that we have seasons. It's part of his design. Pre-fall, there were seasons. Seasons are a good thing. Um, hey, and as we wrap up one year and head towards the Christmas season here, uh, we have a couple of things I want to mention. First is, later this week, one of the ministries of the church, the arts program, is putting on a show, A Christmas Carol, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I know several of you are involved. There are going to be performances Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings. So that's December 9th, 10th, and 11th, and then a matinee on Saturday at like 1 or 2, 1, and then a light, late mat matinee on Sunday at 4 p.m., um, and I mentioned that for Three reasons. One, you should go and support your, your friends who are part of this thing. Uh, secondly, it's just going to be super quality. I had the opportunity to be in it a couple of years ago, and it was amazing. And I'm so, I'm kind of like bummed I'm not in it this time, but I'm glad I'm going to be able to watch it and uh, just kind of see what's going down. So it's going to be a lot of fun in itself. But thirdly, I would encourage you, this time of year, people that are typically not interested in being with a group of Christians might be open to being with a group of Christians. And uh, so both with a Christmas carol, but also our Christmas Eve gathering, if you're around, I want to encourage you, use these events as bridge building opportunities, invite coworkers, neighbors, family members. Um, it's going to be a great show. And then uh, jumping ahead, Christmas Eve, December 24th, we're going to be here 7 p.m., and uh, it's going to be a great time just celebrating Jesus, talking about the gospel, the reality that, that he came to save. We will be having our regular Sunday service on December 26th. Uh, so is that a Sunday? Yeah, okay. And then the following week, January 2nd, we will be doing a combined service over at CFC Madrid. So if you're around January 2nd, 
don't come to this building. You're, you're, you're welcome to come and knock on the door, but nobody will be here. So we'll try to we'll post some signs. But over at CFC Madrid, G- Sunday, January 2nd, 1015 a.m., we'll do a combined service. So Christian Fellowship Center is a multi-site church. We have several locations, and it's really fun a couple times a year to get together and uh, just celebrate as a large group. So we'll be over there Sunday, January 2nd. Looking ahead, a couple of notes. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I want to drop it again. Uh, Eric Trulis, one of the pastors at CFC, he's at the Potsdam location, is he spent several years in Turkey doing missions work, uh, helping establish a church in Eliza, which is like... It's almost part of like Kurdistan, if you know Middle Eastern geography. So it's in, in southeastern Turkey, right near Iraq. And uh, he's, he has a lot of connections in Turkey now. And he's hoping to bring a team from the church this coming May, like late May. And as he puts together the details, like precise dates and things like that, he's, he wants to work with those who are willing and able. And so if, if you've thought about, if, even if you never have, if you've maybe ruled yourself out, like, I can't do that. Hey, maybe you can get over there for a week or two. Bless some believers. Be part of what God's doing. Encourage them. I want to encourage you. Think about missions and how you can be involved. And if you're interested in this trip, reach out to Eric Trulis. Let him know you're interested, and you guys can work on that. Um, A couple more things. The beginning of the year, we're going to launch the year off with a series of prayer meetings. Um, We'll have six of them. So it's going to be Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, January 3rd, 5th, and 6th, and then the following week, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, January 10th, 12th, and 13th. And those will be at various CFC locations and outreach locations. Um, The gathering at Canton will be Monday, January 10th, so the Monday of the the second week of prayer gatherings. That'll all be on the email, but I just wanted to give you kind of a heads up uh, before we get like totally lost in the Christmas season, and then January hits, and we're like, what's going on? I just want to put that on, on your calendar. It's going to be great. Amen. Hey, uh, at this point, I want to shift into the sermon. We're going to begin a three-part series called Who is Jesus? And I'm going to put this mic down. <laughs> and sound different. Okay. So a three-part series entitled, Who is Jesus? And, and one of the amazing things about the Christmas story is just seeing the different names that Jesus has given that really uh, just open up an understanding regarding who he is. And I want to look at several texts today. I've decided, I've thought about it for the, over the years, and I decided for some reason this week, I'm not going to put the text of Scripture up on the display I want to like force us to be in our Bibles, whether it's on your phone or a physical Bible, both is fine. But I'm a fan of Bibles. Uh, if you don't have access to a Bible, maybe you didn't bring one or you don't have one on your phone, Rick has a stack in the back. Just raise your hand if you need a Bible and he'll get you one. Anybody need a Bible? Awesome. Okay, he's got a stack. And if you don't have a Bible at home, feel free to just bring that back with you. It's a gift from us to you. Excellent. So we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 1 which is page 549, if you just grab one of those Bibles. So page 549, Matthew chapter 1. And chapter 1s don't have page numbers in those books, so look for 550 and then turn back one. (laughs) Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Let's pray, and then we're going to begin just to, to submit ourselves to the teaching of the word of the Lord. Amen. Lord God, I thank you for... I thank you for you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you that you've created us. Lord, we were created by you and for you. Our lives are to be for your glory. So, Lord, I pray, would you meet us today? Would you just continue the work that you've begun in us? We need you, Lord Jesus. Draw us by your Holy Spirit. Lord God, I pray, would you help us to hear well and not simply be hearers only, but doers of the word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, 
an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, that name right there. Jesus, it tells us something about who he is. Names are significant. I do not envy those of you who have had to go through the difficult task of naming a child recently, in some cases. Uh, you know, when we think about names for children, we might think about family names, maybe just think about what has a nice ring to it. I've always liked the name Drew for some reason. But like, you know, like, there are a number of things that you might consider, factor in. One of them might be the meaning of the name. You can look up. There are like name books that will give you the meaning of the various names. I would say generally in our cultural context, the meaning of the name is like secondary or tertiary in terms of the list of considerations, and that's fine. But what we see in Scripture is that the meaning of the name is often pretty significant, maybe even primary. And not just primary, but like divinely, like, given. Like, this means something for us as we consider these stories. And the, and the name for Jesus wasn't just like, oh, this is a great name with a great meaning. This was a name with a prophetic meaning, a fulfillment of, of who he was born, well, he already was, so what he was born to do. <laughs> uh, what he was born to do. Names are significant. And in this passage, we see that Jesus is given the name Jesus, <laughs> but also the name Emmanuel. And I want to consider these two names given to the Christ child. Jesus. You will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is a transliteration of the Greek, which is a transliteration of the Hebrew. And you see that process behind me. I don't actually know Hebrew. It's like something like Yahashua or something like that. And uh, actually, a translation straight from the Hebrew into the English would be Joshua. Uh, Joshua, son of Nun, who was one of the leaders of Israel, who led the children of Israel into the promised land after Moses was deceased. Uh, let's see, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, who was a high priest during the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple at the beginning of the second temple period, right? So you see some, some notable Joshua's in the Old Testament. Well, that, Jesus had the same name as them, except it was transliterated into Greek, and in Greek it's Jesus. They don't have a J. So just a, it's an, like an I functionally. It's an iota at the beginning, right? So Jesus, and then you take Jesus and you transliterate it into, you know, Spanish, and you get Jesus, and to English, you get Jesus. And, and so that's what Jesus is, but what is the Greek, or the Hebrew, excuse me, where this thing comes from? Well, it, it's a name composed of two Hebrew words. Two Hebrew words. One of the Hebrew words is the word for to save, and the other one is from the proper name for God, Yahweh or Jehovah. And it means Jehovah is salvation. So Jesus is given the name Jesus because Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And this is God's salvation for us. This is Jehovah is salvation. And I just want to dwell on that for a moment. In, in the verse in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, it says he came to save his people from their sins. And that preposition from, I just want to lean into it a little bit. From came to save his people from their sins. The, the preposition that's used there, a pi, it, it means like away from. There, there's a, a very visceral movement being indicated here, a movement, not just to, like, to come to, to whitewash sin, but to like move us out of that entirely, to move us into a different world, a different kingdom, a different like, plane of existence. 
we are forgiven, but it's not a forgiven where it's like, bum, bum, that looks pretty good. I mean, like, you can clean things up with a coat of paint, but this is like a new construction project, uh, something brand new. We have been saved from our sins, nothing to do with that old thing. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I want to look to Colossians chapter 1. It's on page 668. Look for 669. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And as we read this, I want, to, I want to encourage you to look for that movement. As Jesus has done a work, and, and certainly that work is it's a forgiving work. We've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, but not just washed. We've been saved from, like moved away from that sin, that the old way of existence. God has something better for us. Jesus is forgiver. He is healer. He's also a leader. And he wants to lead us in righteousness, lead us in holiness. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In him we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. I love that picture. We've been, like, literally moved from one domain into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He's come to save us from our sins. I, I think too often, if you want to use a, a, an analogy here that breaks down rather quickly, but all analogies do eventually. <laughs> Imagine us in our natural state, almost like we're, we're chained up in a dungeon cell. Too often... The, the, the salvation that we consider when we think about the fact that Jesus died for our sins is like he breaks down the door and cuts off the chains. And then we just kind of stay in the dungeon. <laughs> Jesus broke down the door and he freed us from those shackles and he's leading us away from that thing. He's saving us from our sins. There's this a movement. We're being moved from this domain of darkness into the kingdom of the sun. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2, into his marvelous light. <laughs> there are lots of texts for this. Fortunately for you, I only chose a few. <laughs> I want to consider a story that we find in the middle of the book of Genesis that really illustrates this movement, being saved away from sin. And the story is, is found in the middle of Genesis. If you would turn to Genesis chapter 18, that's page 8, if you have one of those Bibles Genesis chapter 18, and we're jumping here into the middle of the story of Abraham. Um, there was a man named Abraham, or Abram at the time, and his wife Sarai, and Abraham was a man of faith. His wife was barren, but the Lord had promised him a covenant between Abraham and God, but also with his many descendants. But Abraham and Sarah were childless. They had no progeny, and, and, and so Abraham starts thinking, okay, this is God's will. I'm going to make it happen. Sarah suggests to Abraham, hey, why don't you have sex with my slave? Then we'll have a child. We'll use her like a surrogate, so to speak. And so Abraham does that, and they, and they have a son named Ishmael. And long story short, God wants to do something miraculous here. Something that must be done by faith, not something that's fulfilled according to the flesh. And the Lord's plan is to open Sarah's womb and give them a miracle child, Isaac. And the Lord and two angels shows up. This is like a theophany or Christophany. It's an appearance of God pre-Jesus. Like God has appeared to us in Jesus. The fullness of the Godhead. We're going to get there next week. But like... Here, in the Old Testament, at times, you see the, the Lord manifests himself, appear to people. And here in Genesis 18, the Lord and two angels appear to Abram and Sarai. 
and tell him of the promised son. And then considers the situation of two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, wealthy, influential, powerful cities in that region. Cities full of great decadence and debauchery. And God considers their state and brings judgments. And I want to read a a chunk of Genesis 18 where Abram intercedes on behalf of his, ooh, I should have confirmed this, nephew. Is Lot Abraham's nephew? Oh, yeah, thank you. It's hard to think when you're in front of people, so I try to, like, check things beforehand, but I forgot to check that one. Uh, He intercedes for his nephew Lot because Lot, his wife, and his daughters and sons-in-law lived in Sodom. And that's where we're going to jump into the story. So Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. The men got up from there and looked out over Sodom. These are, this is the Lord and two angels. And Abraham was walking with them to see them off. Then the Lord said, should I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down to see if what they have done justifies the cry that has come up to me. If not, I will find out. The men turned from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham stepped forward and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep, sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it? You could not possibly do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. You could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham said, Since I have ventured to speak to my Lord, even though I am dust and ashes, suppose the fifty righteous lack five. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? He replied, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Then he spoke to him again. Suppose forty are found there. He answered, I will not do it on account of forty. Then he said, let my Lord not be angry, and I will speak further. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Then he said, since I have ventured to speak to my Lord, suppose 20 are found there. He replied, I will not destroy it on account of 20. Then he said, let my Lord not be angry, and I will speak one more time. Suppose 10 men are found there. He answered, I will not destroy it. On account of ten, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he departed, and Abraham returned to his place. The next verse, Genesis 19.1. The two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in Sodom's gateway. When Lot saw them, this is Abraham's nephew, he got up to meet them. He bowed with his face to the ground and said, My Lord, turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet, and spend the night. Then you can get up early and go on your way. No, they said. We would rather spend the night in the square. But he urged them so strongly that they followed him and went into his house. He prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread for them, and they ate it. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population surrounded the house. They called out to Lot and said, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us that we can have sex with them. Lot went out to them at the entrance and shut the door behind him. He said, don't do this evil, my brothers. Look, I've got two daughters who who haven't been intimate with a man. I'll bring them out to you, and you can do whatever you want to them. However, don't do anything to these men, because they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the way, they said, adding, this one came here as an alien, but he's acting like a judge. Speaking of Lot. By the way, I'm not going to address Lot's horrific compromise. (laughs) We basically preached this like three weeks ago when we were in Judges chapter 19. Um, If you weren't there then and have questions, I'd be happy to talk more afterwards. 
It's horrible, yes. The, unfortunately, the Bible, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. Fortunately, the Bible accurately depicts the reality of the human condition. Unfortunately, that is grievously evil too often. Continuing on, even by people who are like God-fearers. So verse 9, get out of the way, they said, adding, this one came here as an alien, but he's acting like a judge. Now we'll do more harm to you than to, to them. They put pressure on Lot and came to break the door down, but the angels reached out, brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the entrance of the house, both old and young, with blindness, so that they were unable to find the entrance. Then the angels said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, a son-in-law, your sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Look at the very end of verse 12 there. Get them out of this place. I just want to, again, be looking for the movement as we look through this story. Verse 14. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said. Get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. At daybreak, the angels urged Lot on, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. Because of the Lord's compassion for him, the men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. They brought him and left him outside the city. As soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, Run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has indeed found favor, favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness by saving my life. But I can't run to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, this town is close enough for me to flee to. It is a small place. Please let me run to it. It's only a small place, isn't it? So that I can survive. And he said to him, All right, I'll grant your request about this matter too, and will not demolish the town you mentioned. Hurry up, run to it, for I cannot do anything until you get there. Therefore, the name of the city is Zoar. The sun had risen over the land when Lot reached Zoar. Then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the Lord. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the city, and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Early in the morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and all the plain, all the land of the plain. And he saw that the smoke was going up from the land like the smoke of a furnace. So it was, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he demolished the cities where Lot had lived. Now, in this story, we get a very uh, vivid glimpse of the sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, its sister city, associated with it. As these men wanted to, to rape the, the visitors and potentially rape them to death, and then they, they took action against Lot, some alien. Obviously, they had never accepted him. Um, well, you get, a, you get a picture, but in Ezekiel chapter 16, the condition of Sodom is made even more plain and understandable. Very briefly, in Ezekiel chapter 16, if you would turn there, this is page 476 in the Bibles. I'll just call them Pew Bibles, even though I don't have pews. 476 in the Pew Bible. Ezekiel 16. Two verses. This is a prophetic word to the people of God and a people of God who are looking all too similar to the sinful peoples who had been around them at times. And Ezekiel shares this prophetic word by the Spirit of the Lord regarding Sodom. Verse 49, Now this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, plenty of food, and comfortable security, but didn't support the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable acts before me. So I removed them when I saw this. You know, when I read Genesis 19, 
Certainly I can think of happenings around the globe that it reminds me of. But it seems pretty distant. I don't think many of us, hopefully, never in a lifetime, encounter mobs of people trying to rape people to death. Um, That's pretty horrific. It happens, uh, but hopefully it's beyond the bounds of even just normal amongst sinful peoples. But this description of Sodom here, Ezekiel 16, describing their general state certainly includes detestable acts. But wow, here they are in their pride, in their abundance. It says they have plenty of food, comfortable security. They didn't support the poor and needy. They were just selfish, self-centered, short-sighted, and engaging in detestable acts. I'm like, wow, that, that heads a lot closer to home. I think we live in a land that could be described by Ezekiel 16, verses 49 and 50. Now, maybe God's calling you to go, go to Thailand or, or Poland. I don't know. The, the point of this message is not to flee America. I don't think you can flee to a place that isn't marked by sin. But the word of the Lord to the people of God is to be in the world but not of it. To be a separate people who've been called out because Jesus came to save us from our sins. To to save us away from that thing. We're supposed to be distinct, different, holy as he is holy. And church, when we consider who Jesus is, I just want to lean into this truth. He came to save us from our sins. And it it is too easy to say, thank you Jesus, I'm, I'm forgiven. And just chill in the dungeon. And the word of the Lord is, is kind of like, and I realize this is also an analogy, but it's like the angel to Lot, run, get out of here. Like, I've got something better for you. He's come to save us from our sins, to, to move us away from that thing, to translate us from darkness to light, into his kingdom. So church, the word, word of the Lord today is repent, embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord. A, a, Follow him away from your sins. Follow him away from your sins. Who is Jesus? Jesus is Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. He came to save his people from their sins. Just as those angels were spurring Lot and his family to run, Jesus is calling us, run, run away from that darkness. Run away from that stuff. Lay aside the, the, the sin, the weights that can so easily ensnare us and weigh us down. I want to move on to Emmanuel in a moment, but let's take a minute and pray right now. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, you are Savior, and, and I'm quite sure we've all heard that many more times than we could recount. But Lord, I pray this morning, in just in a poignant way, Lord, would you remind us and make real to us in a fresh way with the greatness of your grace to forgive us our sins as we humble ourselves before you as Savior and Lord. Lord, and I pray for a full understanding of the gospel that doesn't stop with the chains have been you know, knocked off. I'm free. But an understanding that says, Jesus is leading me out. (laughs) He's leading me away from this stuff, moving me from one kingdom to another. Lord, I thank you that you are Savior. And this is really, really, really good news. We love you, Lord. Amen. In Matthew chapter 1, the angel tells Joseph, call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that name tells us something about who Jesus is. And then Isaiah chapter 7 is quoted. He will be called Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And I was going to read out of Matthew 1 again, but I basically just summarized it all. (laughs) You can flip there if you want to. God with us. Now, this is another Hebrew word that's just been transliterated into the Greek. And they're actually so similar that I don't know if you've ever wondered, wait, is Emmanuel with an I or is Emmanuel with an E? 
when it's transliterated from the Hebrew, it's an I. When it's translated, transliterated from the Greek, it's an E. And in some translations, like the CSB, which is what I'm preaching out of, it uses the I in the New Testament too, just so that they're like the same thing. Sometimes it even says Messiah in the New Testament instead of Christ. It's, it's just like trying to like simplify an understanding. But like, it's the same word. And what it means is God. I don't know if you noticed, Emmanuel, there's El. El is one of the, is a Hebrew word for God. It's like Beth El, the house of God, right? And so Emmanuel, and it's among us, God. God is with us. God is among us. The, the meaning is given right here in this passage. And, you know, whether it's an I or an E is trivial. But what it means is really profound. God with us. God with us. The God of the universe took on flesh and was born of mean estate. He didn't simply appear, as he has appeared a number of times throughout history, like he appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18. He didn't just appear for a moment. He was born, grew up, worked, ministered, died, and rose again. God among us. And we might even ask, how does this work? God can't die. True. <laughs> in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, in 1 Peter 3, 16, it, it, Paul begins, he says, Great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. And, and our mystery in the New Testament doesn't mean exactly what it means to us in our common vernacular, but close-ish enough. And it's like, it's a mystery. I don't know exactly. Like, Jesus was truly God, and we see that, and we'll talk about that more next week. And he's truly human. He learned, grew in favor with the Father, it says at the end of Luke chapter 2. He probably spilled the milk. He never sinned, but he was a kid. It, like, isn't that like mind-boggling? God with us, God among us. And certainly when we see this word used in Isaiah 7, when we see it used in Matthew 1, it's talking about the reality that God took on flesh and, and was among us that he might save us from our sins. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 gets at this a little bit. If you could turn there, Philippians 2, that's page 666. If you have one of the few Bibles, look for 667. Um, Paul tries to like grab a little bit of, of what it is <laughs> That the God of the universe took on flesh and dwelt among us. God with us. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. He's exhorting the believers to humility. And he says, you want to know the model of humility? <laughs> like for you and me, taking the role of a servant, probably where you should have been all along. <laughs> God of the universe, the creator, becoming part of the creation to save us. This is humility. Adopt the same attitude as that of Jesus Christ, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is with us. It's amazing and beautiful truth. And clearly, God took on flesh and dwelt among us that he might save us. But one of the amazing things we see in Jesus' teachings is Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. I'm not going to leave you orphans. Flip over to John chapter 14. This is page 613 on the Pew Bible. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. Because the reality is this. Jesus isn't walking around the earth anymore. You can't go to Jerusalem and meet him or New York City or wherever. Uh, he, Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father. But Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. John 14, 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. 
In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and reveal myself to him. How is Jesus with us today? For most of us, the answer is probably a bit of a no-brainer. He sent his Holy Spirit. He sent his Holy Spirit. Right before Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, he said, Wait in Jerusalem until you're filled with power from on high. Just John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There is a, I'm leaving, but I'm going to come back to you. I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you orphans. God is with us. Jesus said, right at the end of Matthew's gospel, he records Jesus saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is with us. And and so we can look back and we can celebrate Jesus' physical dwelling among humanity as people that we might be born again into the family of God. But church, Emmanuel is with us today. That's who Jesus is. He is the one who is dwelling among his, his people, his church, we are the dwelling place of God. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a building. You'd go to Jerusalem. There's a building there. and you'd, Here's God's presence. In the New Testament, we are the carriers of God's presence. I just want to remind us of that reality. Remind us of that reality. God is with us. So who is Jesus? Jesus is Jehovah is salvation. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. I want to walk in that truth. The worship team, come on back up. Amen. Lord God, I thank you for your presence, Lord Jesus, your salvation. Lord, I pray for everyone present this morning, those those joining via live stream. Lord, I pray that we would turn to you as Savior, Lord, and that we would turn to you for relationship because you're present with us. Lord, we designed for you and by you. We run to you today. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who's, who has never turned to you for salvation, Lord, I pray today, grant them mercy, Lord God. Grant them repentance. You know, if you're here and you're, you're wondering, am I saved? Am, am I in? You don't need to wonder anymore. There's, there's no special prayer There's no verse you have to memorize. There's no test you have to pass. Jesus is inviting you. Humble yourself and say, Jesus, I need you. Lord, I can't can't save myself. I've been designed for you. I've been caught up in that pride and just the, the detestable acts and this and that. And Jesus, I need you. I need your grace. He is near to save. He is near to save. Hmm. You know, Louisa shared this prophetic exhortation earlier about relationship. God is with us. Let's not let a single day pass without talking with him, without communing, without walking with the Lord who is with us. You guys want to share? Come on up. What I keep hearing in my spirit throughout this message is um, experiential knowledge. And I believe that the Lord is calling us to deeper experiences with him and his spirit. And uh, this verse came to mind, Ephesians 1, 17. Um, I keep asking that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as he, as the, uh, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name 
that is invoked not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him head over everything for the church, which is his body and the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Amen. Thanks. Amen. Let's stand up to our feet. Lord, we look to you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, open the eyes of our understanding, I pray. Enlarge us, Lord. We need you.
Amen. Hey, I want to invite some members of the prayer team up, if you could. We're going to dismiss the service in just a moment, but I want to I want to invite you, but not just invite, I want to urge, kind of like a get out. If you feel like the Holy Spirit is prompting you to, to, to take action today, it's a privilege to pray with one another. Um, maybe it's the first time you've come to Jesus, or maybe it's like, Man, it's the 10,000th, but I need the Lord today. I want to walk with him. Um, I want to encourage you. Let's, let's pray together. And let's go forward in relationship with the Lord, following his leadership. For he has saved us away from our sins. Amen.